So today I want to talk about the homicide of Tracy Kirkpatrick. Tracy was a 17 year old senior and she was murdered in Frederick, Maryland on March 15th, 1989. Uh, very interesting case with a little bit of a confession twist to it. it what's important to remember about these videos and these cases is sometimes we don't have all the information most times that's the way it is people that have that are not even the families it's law enforcement so there might be some discrepancies or things that are left out but the most important thing is to get it out to as many people as you can um, think about advertising you know, and things of that nature, and bulletin boards, you do that so people see it. And it may spark renewed interest in the cold cases, or it may spark somebody's memory, or their remorse, or their guilt, whatever it is, in order to get the case solved. So with that in mind, let's dive into Tracy Kirkpatrick. Uh, the first thing we start with, as you know, is victimology. Again, 17-year-old senior working two jobs, uh, two part-time jobs and going to school. Her GPA was between 3.75 and 4.0. Apparently, like uh, the, nobody had anything bad to say about her. Now, that's not unusual for the most part when you have victims. Even, even prostitutes that get murdered and stuff uh, nobody wants to say anything disparaging about them. Now, am I saying there's anything disparaging about being a sex worker? No. Uh, what you, in my eyes, and I, what you do with your life and how you earn a living and things that you like to do, I mean, that's that's on you. Uh, that has no bearing. That would make you a, a higher risk victim. A prostitute is a high risk victim compared to Tracy. Now, what makes Tracy's elevated risk a little bit more than normal would be her working alone at these department stores, in which she did. Uh, at the time of her death, Tracy had applied to Mount St. Mary's College and apparently was pursuing a accounting degree and she also had aspirations to be a lawyer and unfortunately none of those was ever met but that victimology tells me a few things uh, there's still a lot more I'd want to know now I read uh, newspaper articles and quotes that her sister had given that said that they weren't allowed to date until they were 18 well she was 17 and she apparently had a ex-boyfriend already who we'll talk about later. So those are things that I want to know more about when it comes to victimology. So that pitter patter of feet you hear again is my dog Justice, who just cannot seem to leave me alone anymore when I am recording. When he hears my voice, he's got to come downstairs and walk around and you know, here, here's a picture of Justice, I'll show you picture him now he just heard his name being called so he stopped but he'll settle down here in a minute and again he'll probably start snoring just as is my trusty yellow lab um, 
and that's uh, all I have to say about Justice. So if you hear the pitter patter of feet, it's just his toenails on the wood floor. Now let's get back to Tracy. Uh, on March 15th, 1989, she was working alone in a woman's sporting goods clothing store, I believe called Eileen's. And the store was to close at 9 o'clock. It's in a plaza. Um, we'll get into the timeline, uh, and which is very narrow, of when things occurred. At 7.30 that night, her mom had brought her food. A timeline is very important, obviously, into establishing not only the time of death, but also uh, suspects, alibis, and things of that nature. So, at 7.30 p.m., mom brought her food. Everything's okay. She said she was tired. She wanted to go home, go to bed, then not, nothing unusual. 8 o'clock, the manager called. To, I believe they called, and this is when the discrepancies come in. I don't know if they called or they showed up. Uh, regardless, they checked in to see how everything was going. That could just be a manager covering their ass because having a single person, 17-year-old, close a store um, by themselves, I don't know. I think it's frowned upon today. I don't think it would happen today. But back then, maybe it was more prevalent. Uh, could that deter a criminal? Sure. But you look at my previous video uh, that I did on the yogurt shop murders and how I believe four girls were killed and burned uh, and sexually assaulted. Apparently, numbers made no difference in that case. However, it certainly could in this case. So 8 o'clock, everything's okay. 9 to 9.30, security guard who is an off-duty deputy, sheriff deputy, uh, moonlighting, if you will. He has another job as a security officer. He goes by and he still sees the lights on. Uh, he believes that she's just still closing up the store and is not alarmed. But he sees nothing out of the ordinary. At 10.45, the same security guard goes back by the door the store and notices the lights are still on now red flags go up for him he goes inside and in a storage room which is important they find the body of Tracy Kirkpatrick she was stabbed to death so there's your timeline um, I mean, think you can narrow it down between eight and 1045 at the greatest and maybe you know from 8 to 930 at the latest but you would be making an assumption there and we shouldn't do that in any investigations So from timeline now, let's go to evidence. What is collected, what is seen? There are apparently no witnesses that saw anything out of the ordinary. Now, that is not uncommon. You are, I, I, I correlate it to the yogurt shop murders where there was really no witnesses to that crime either. And here you had four murders and an arson. So, and it was at the same time, you know, the store was closing. When a store is closing like that, the first thing you have to look at on, as mo motive to these murders or any murders that happen when a store is closing is robbery. The second thing you, I think that you have to look for is stalker, sexual fantasy type of killing. So we have to determine which it is in this, and maybe it's neither of them, but what the evidence shows is that there was a blood smear on the rear door, exit door of that store. Now that tells me that someone had to have known that there was a rear exit door. Now not necessarily, 
right? Put yourself in the shoes. You're in there. Uh, you commit a murder. Um, you had to have come in through the front, right? The only way you could have came in through the back, that door should have been locked. Now, I say should have been because we don't know. We weren't there. But again, possibilities versus probabilities. To me, it's more probable the rear entrance door would have been locked. Now, I would want to know which way Tracy would exit when she left the store, when she closed. Because when the security uh, officer found her body, the front door was still unlocked. Blood smear on the rear door uh, and a partial print. I see that as great evidence, but it also, I believe, would show that he exited the suspect. I say he will get into whether it's a he or not about the, the exit through the rear. That tells me more than likely that they knew that there was a rear exit. I'd like to know where that rear exit led, probably to a parking lot, but I don't know the store layout. I couldn't see that from any of the pictures that I got, but uh, it is, a, it is a, a clue. Now, let's get into some, some discrepancies. I preach this over and over again. Unless you have the police reports, you are always guessing and hoping. You're hoping that it's right, that the information that you are starting your investigation on is correct. In this instance, the newspaper articles, the day after Tracy's death, indicated she was stabbed seven or eight times. There was no defensive wounds and there was no struggle indicating that she more than likely knew her offender. Now that last part, that there, and they also said there was no evidence of a break-in which would lead investigators to believe she knew her killer. Man, I have a big problem with that. Big problem with that. You cannot deduce that because there was no break-in, that she knew her killer. Let's say she's counting out the store receipts, closing out shop for the day, door's still open, the offender walks in. She doesn't know him. He pretends he's shopping. She says, oh, we're going to be closing in five minutes. Yep, yeah, okay. Um, he pulls a gun, let's say. Get in the back. Pulls out a knife. Kills her. There's no struggle in the store. So how can you say that she had to have known her killer because there was no struggle? That came from a police officer. One of the detectives. I'm hoping that's a mistake. Because you, can, you cannot deduce that. Back to discrepancies. So I said she was stabbed seven or eight times. That's what is reported. I read an article from 20 years later who says this information came right from the autopsy report that was released to the newspaper where she was stabbed 22 times. Head, neck, back, arms, chest, multiple fractures to her skull due to three stab wounds. Are you kidding me? See the discrepancies here? This case is a big teachable moment on that. The day after the murders, she was stabbed seven or eight times, no defensive wounds. 20 years later, read the paper, and the paper quoted its source, being the autopsy report that was released to them, that she was stabbed 22 times in all those areas, head, neck, back, arms, chest, defensive wounds to her hand.
That changes everything! Right? It boggles my mind how things get distorted. And that is one of the reasons. Don't get upset at the police officers for not releasing info or thinking you know more than the police. Because I'm only here to tell you, you don't. Now you can get mad at me. You can say what you want. The reason that is, is because they have all the info. Now you may be smarter than the police when you get all that info and put it all together. Yes, then maybe. But knowledge is power. And they all have that. Now what they choose to do with it, how you interpret that knowledge, well that's a different story. So it goes from a seven or eight stab wound, which tells me one thing, to 22, which tells me something completely different. Defensive wounds now, where before it was saying there was not one defensive wound, and she knew her killer. Changes things, okay? Now, that's not the most disturbing part about this case. The most disturbing part about the case is in June, of 1990, so uh, over a year, but according to the caller, a few months after this murder, there was an individual who made a call to a national confessional hotline. Didn't call the FBI, didn't call 911, didn't call the police department, didn't call the newspaper, like Zodiac would have. What they did is they called this national hotline now what i find interesting about this national hotline is that it's a pay by the minute type of deal where you call and confess your sins and then people pay to listen to them regardless an individual called in and confessed to this murder and i want you to listen to this confession and get your thoughts on whether you think this confession is valid or not. Take a listen. Hello, my name is Scott, and I'm calling from Frederick, Maryland. I know this is going to sound surprising, but three months ago, I stabbed the girl to death. And you might think that in making mistakes, I'm setting myself up to be caught, but there are a lot of guys being done in Frederick. The girl I killed was working in a ladies sportswear store. I often came by and talked to her when she was working alone. And one night when she was in the storeroom and we were talking, our conversation turned into an argument. And so I took out a knife that I had with me at all times and I killed her. And a few days later I realized that I had created a lot of sadness. I thought about turning myself into the police. But whatever they do to me, that won't bring Tracy back. So I decided that I better be free because we have the death penalty in Maryland. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm sorry about what I did, but nothing can change it. Bye. Now, what do you think? Right off the bat, I would say it sounds legit. Now again, we don't know if this is the full confession. What are the police holding back? Much like in the Delphi case, they're holding some information back. And you, you do that for specific reasons. Let's think about this case specifically. Originally, stabbed seven or eight times, no defensive wounds. That's what's put out, okay? That may have been done intentionally, and I'll tell you why. Is because now, let's say they get a suspect, and they ask the suspect when they're questioning them, or let's say the suspect confesses. Okay, you killed her. Tell me how it happened. Well, we got in an argument, and I stabbed her 
well, how many times did you stab her, sir? Seven or eight times. Did she put up a struggle? No, she didn't. Well, guess what? You just booted him right out onto the street where he came from because he got all that information from the police that who released that information to the newspapers because we know she was stabbed 22 times and she did put up a struggle and she did have defensive wounds. So now do you understand why police do that? I'm not saying that happened in this case. It seemed very plausible that that is what occurred, but we don't know. So at some point in time after this confession, a person calls the police and says, I recognize that voice. She's a psychic. Now, you all know how I feel about psychics, but regardless, she's a witness now. If she says she recognizes the voice, why, how? Well, apparently, this individual had sent her newspaper clipping articles of the murder and was having some sort of correspondence with her. Because this guy who doesn't seem to be the sharpest knife in the drawer we put his return address on this correspondent with this psychic they were able to conclude they being the police that the person that called the confession line and this person who is corresponding with the psychic are one in the same and they subsequently do a search warrant on this guy's house now i failed to mention that they were able to trace the confession call to Frederick, Maryland. Now, to me, that is significant. Could have been anywhere in the country because remember this confession hotline is out of Las Vegas. But somebody from that very town where this girl was murdered called for the confession. It was at a supermarket payphone. Now, that tells me that the person is smart enough to know that I have to use a payphone in order to make this call. Thinks he's smart enough. Um, so then it begs the question whether his real name is Don. Now, the psychic said that her correspondence was with a guy named Sean. So you see, Don, Sean, is he making up the name? But what's the deal? I don't think this guy has ever been publicly put out there as a suspect, but he obviously was. And they got a search warrant, and the search warrant was for some items in his house, but also from his body. So they were taking hair samples and stuff to compare to what they have in evidence. And it's a good thing that his name was not put out there, right? I'm, you know I'm a big believer uh, that we should never do that. Morbid, I believe, from the Lisa Lamb thing. Um, I mean, there's so many others. I mean, that's just the one that sticks out to me the most. These people that get bullied and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I bullying is the number one... Uh, probably top three things that I despise in this world. So I never want to see anybody's name put out there as a suspect, even if they are a suspect. Like we're going to talk about a couple suspects that I believe sh should be looked at and probably were, but I'm not going to mention them by name uh, because I don't do that. Let's go back to the crime scene and does it tell you anything? Well, now that I know she was stabbed 22 times and she did put up a fight, which I'm not surprised. When I read there was no defense of stab wounds and she was stabbed in the chest and the back, um, the first thing that I would think of is that she was restrained. That's the only way you're not going to get stab wounds. You're not going to stand there and say, go ahead and stab me. Even if you're caught off guard and you're surprised, 
You're having a normal conversation with somebody and next thing you know, they produce a knife and stab you in the chest. Your natural instinct, even if the first one catches you good, is to put up your, your hand. And I would expect at least one defensive stab wound. So when they say, in any case, when they say there are none, there's no defensive stab wounds. Then there are e stab wounds are tough. Gunshot wounds, I understand. Nobody moves faster than a bullet, contrary to popular belief. Not even Bruce Lee. You get shot, you get shot. No, no defensive marks. But stab wounds are different. So anytime I see that, when there's no de defensive wounds, I think right away uh, restraints. There is no indication of that here, but again, I would not, I would not have been surprised had she been restrained and police kept that information. So, 22 stab wounds. Now, the amateur detective, the people that have not studied the, I almost said the art of homicide, in some cases, you could look at it as an art. There are serial killers who perfected their craft, such as Ted Bundy. But homicides can be obviously very sloppy, and that's how the FBI came up with a disorganized offender. Um, but again, the amateur detective will say right off the bat, well, that's overkill. I hate that term. I hate it. I despise it. And the reason I despise it is because you can't say. Let me take it back. You can say it's overkill. Anybody can say anything they want because the first stab wound killed them. Therefore, everything after that is overkill. Sure. Scientifically speaking, that's overkill. But people want to throw out that term all the time when there's multiple stab wounds. And most of the time in homicides, by knife, there are multiple stab wounds. Very rarely will you see one. It has happened, of course. I can think of, I believe, a girl at Petit Library at Penn State. I want to say Betsy Artsma, but I could be wrong. And I believe she may have been stabbed one time. But generally speaking, just like everyone wants to tell me, well, you always say that killers bring their own weapons. They don't go to a house with the intent to kill and not bring a weapon. Tommy Lee Sells did. Tommy Lee Sells. Tommy Lee Sells. I'm so sick of hearing Tommy Lee Sells. Yes! It does occur. But I'm saying, out of 99%, you will always have that 1%. Okay? So, overkill is a term that I think is thrown about too much. And then you want to go further and say, because of overkill, it has to be somebody who knew her. No. That's how innocent people get locked up. That's how innocent people go to jail and become suspects and have their whole life ruined. Because now, you're focusing in on a boyfriend, people who don't, okay, you're, now you're focusing in on a boyfriend. You go and interview the boyfriend and all of a sudden he doesn't have an alibi because he says he was home and in bed. And it's the truth. But he's forever linked to this murder now because you want to say it was overkill. And because it was overkill, it was jealousy and pa No. Don't go that deep. Okay? 22 stab wounds. What does that tell you? It tells you, A, he just kept stabbing, stabbing until she stopped moving. That's how the offender knew she was dead. Okay? Or, yes, it could be that I have so much anger for you that I'm just going to keep stabbing until I'm tired. Yes, it could be that. But you don't know which one it was. Okay? We cannot make that determination. You can't. So, because of those wounds, 
and because, according to police, there was no sexual assault. I was going to say I find that odd, and I do a little. Um, I would certainly, you have to look for why somebody is murdered, okay? Again, greed, jealousy, money, robbery, that all falls under greed. Uh, sex, without a doubt. Um, revenge. Those are reasons. And you have to determine what. And you can do that sometimes by looking at the body. In the 22 stab wounds, if there was sexual assault there. Okay, now we're looking at a sexual fantasy um, type of, of murder. Where a sexual assault occurred. But according to police, it didn't occur here. So now, if you're going to rule out the sexual assault component of it. You have greed and jealousy. Um, you have revenge. Did she wrong somebody? So basically, you're looking at whether it's a robbery or did she wrong somebody? Well, according to police, there was no, no money taken. No robbery. Yet I got a problem with that. Initial reports, again, state nothing was taken. There was $60.00 in the cash register it was not taken nothing missing but then I find a news report years later where they were interviewing the dad and the dad said yes her car keys were missing store keys were missing her wallet was missing and then in another report it said her entire purse was missing how can you rule out robbery? Because there's $60 in the cash register? You cannot rule out robbery as a motive if her purse was taken. If her wallet was taken and there was money in it according to dad. So we still can't rule out robbery just because he missed. Now you say missed. Well, he had to have known there was money in the cash register. Maybe. Maybe he intended to go in there and rob it. It escalated to murder because she put up a fight. And you're panicked. You just killed somebody. Lights are on. You got to get out of there. What do you do? You grab the first thing that's near, and maybe that's her purse, and you take it, and you go. You can't rule out robbery as a motive. You can't do that. That's another pet peeve of mine. When people are killed, and they have two rings on and a necklace, and they weren't taken. So people will say, or even police. Robbery is not the motive here because they left the jewelry on the person. You can't say that. You can't say that. Everything is fluid in a homicide. Everything depends on situations. You have no idea what the killer saw, what situation presented itself that he may have had to flee early. You know? He could have been in the process of robbing the place when the security guard walked by and he saw it. And he fled. Didn't take nothing. Okay? So we can't rule out robbery. Now, the jealousy part of it. This is an area of interest of me. And the reason it is, is because the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, that I've come to learn. Remember when victimology said they weren't allowed to date till they were 18, yet she had a boyfriend, at least an ex-boyfriend, and she was only 17. So maybe that was a generalization that the sister made when she gave the quote, or she bucked it, you know what I mean? She bucked the trend and said, hey, I'm gonna have a boyfriend, I'm 17, I don't care what my parents say. 
That's not unusual. The first thing that struck me about the boyfriend was that he showed up at the scene, at the store. Now, because of the stab wounds, and because of the amount of stab wounds, and him showing up at the store, and then I see that his occupation is a security guard. Not the security guard that found her, but still something, remember, when something bothers you, that's where you, where you write it down, and that's where you start your investigation. That's where my investigation would have started here in this case. Would have been with that boyfriend. Not saying that he's a suspect, He's a person of interest. He's somebody that I got to rule out. He could be completely innocent. And I'm not going to tell his name to the public, but I'm going to rule him in or out. That's my job as an investigator. The same with the security guard that found the body. More than likely, he was at the wrong, not the wrong place at the wrong time. He's doing his job. But he's automatically in my mind, going to be a person of interest and I'm going to roll in or out. Just the way it is. I'm sorry for that. I will not release your name publicly and I will not say you're a suspect, but I will do my due diligence in ruling you in or out. See where I'm getting at. You have a security guard who finds her and you have an ex-boyfriend who is a security guard. Most likely completely coincidental. Yet, I am going to rule that in or out. Now, apparently police do or did have two suspects. I doubt that it's the same two people that I just was talking about. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them was. They took this case to a grand jury and the grand jury failed to indict either suspect I would want to know who those suspects obviously are this is a sad case of a girl who loved poetry who had a good head on her shoulders made the right decisions and she was murdered either a because of robbery or B because of jealousy in my mind, it's one of those two things. Now, I said earlier, we'll get into whether it was a male or female killer. I have not ruled out a female as an offender in this. I would seen nothing to indicate that uh, it couldn't be. I would, because, and let me preface this, because when you have a victim who has no enemies that you know of, you have to look at who would potentially have such disdain for an individual. A lot of times, disdain will come from jealousy. And jealousy often comes from lovers. I've seen a lot of girls do a lot of crazy things that I never thought I would see over a broken relationship or over fighting for a guy. That has to be looked into in this instance. Be pretty easy to rule out. I mean, you look at her ex-boyfriend, if she had more than one, and you look at their love interests at the time, and you could rule them in or out. Just because a person was stabbed multiple times, don't rule out a female, okay? I think you make a mistake when you do that. However, when you start looking at possibilities and probabilities, based on statistics alone, I would say that it is possible it could be a female offender, but it is more probable that it is a male. And again, the two areas that I would look at is, is revenge or jealousy and that would fall to me under a love interest of some sort or be a robbery. Okay, 
It's happening when the store is closing. That is a good clue. That is somebody that knows that shopping mall area. Um, but the problem that I have with that, and it's a small problem, and I could get over it quickly, is if a person is casing that area, let's say he is targeting that for a robbery, and the reason he is is because he sees her as the weak link. Maybe he's looked at all the stores and they all have two people or they have older male or, or whatever it is, 17 year old female. I'm keying in on that. That's, that's the one I'm gonna hit. I'm gonna do it when they close. Okay, I'm on board with that. But if he's casing it out, he knows that there's security there. Okay, this happened on a Wednesday as well. I'm a firm believer that most nefarious activities happen on the weekend. Yet I've been surprised at the amount of nefarious activities that take place during the weekday. And that's because criminals, and let me say, a lot of times it's because alcohol is involved on a lot of crime. In addition and to homicide. And that's why the weekend, when people aren't working, is when that usually increases. The weekday, it happens as well, uh, but this is a Wednesday at 9 o'clock. To me, this is somebody that knows her routine. Could it just be a stalker, as I talked about earlier? Sure, but I would, I would certainly think that there would be indications of a sexual assault. Reason being as well. She is removed from the main area of the store and she's taken to a, a change room or a storeroom where they store items. I would want to know why, what is that used for? Is that where she kept her purse and her coat? Whoever did this, I think, led her back there. She's not going to go back there and leave that front door unlocked. Remember, you can go back to victimology. And it would tell you that she's a responsible person. Okay? You guys hear that? That's faint, but that's Justice snoring. Justice, wake up. Hey! <laughs> he opened his eyes, but he didn't move. Uh, you know, Justice made me lose my train of thought. Storeroom. Why was she taken back there? If there's no drag marks in blood, um, that means she was taken back there while she was still alive. I, I highly doubt that somebody would surprise her back in that storeroom, right? Um, she wouldn't go back there without locking that front door. So that tells me that the person came in, doesn't mean that she knows the person. The person came in, accosted her, took her probably at knife point back to that room, and that's where he killed her. Now you go back to the confession where he says, we were in the storeroom and an argument ensued. I have a hard time believing that she would be back there with somebody. I just, unless it was like a friend of hers, but even so, I think she would have locked that door. No, she was taken back there at knife point before nine o'clock, before she was to close that store. And they killed her back there. Now, again, just like I said with um, robbery, you can't say that robbery wasn't a motive. You can't say sexual assault wasn't a motive because maybe something interrupted that sexual assault, the security guard, phone ringing, whatever it was. But a lot of times, in sexual assault murder cases, they will they will go ahead and finish that fantasy, regardless. Even if it is just the act of pulling up a shirt and exposing the breast or pulling down the pants, it will still occur even after death. Even if they are spooked, they may not do the assault itself, but something in a sexual nature will occur. And apparently, I don't know, 
just what's being reported, that isn't the case. So if that isn't the case, I would say it's more probable than not that it was a robbery. Her purse is gone. Why would the offender take her purse if it isn't a robbery? Sure, it could be sexual assault as the primary motivation of the crime and a robbery as second assault. It could be, but there was no indication of sexual assault. So then you have to defer to it being a robbery. And if he takes her back to the store, the storeroom, kills her, lights are still on, door is still open, he probably is scared to go back out into full view of everything and risk being seen. So instead, he just takes what's there, which is in that room, is her purse, more than likely in that room. I could be wrong, but I'm guessing her purse was probably there, and exits. Now, because of that, it would tell me that more than likely he's not a, a, um, a seasoned criminal. Meaning, he probably, he may have done it before. I guess I can't say that for sure. But if he was an experienced criminal, you know, I don't know, it's hard to say. But you would think that if he cased the place out, uh, he would make her lock that door. Maybe not. Maybe that's too too much thinking into it. Um, but he would have taken that money right away. Who knows? Uh, it still doesn't deter me from the thought that if she was not sexually assaulted, that it was robbery. Just because they left $60 in the cash register, it doesn't mean that it's not robbery. Okay? Um, could have been a juvenile type of offender, maybe the same age, 17, 18, probably somebody that's still had a car. Now, her car keys is missing, but her car was found in the parking lot undisturbed, which tells me that, and, and the store keys apparently were missing too. You take those things, but maybe it's just because they were in the purse. You know what I mean? Uh, and they have no significance, and he had no indication that he was going to come back. Um, it would be just too too risky. Experienced offenders do that. We've seen Ted Bundy do that. But this is not... I, I would certainly would be... I wouldn't think that this is a serial offender. Okay? You're not looking at a serial killer in this instance. Is it the guy that confessed? Apparently police have ruled him out. I would like to know how they ruled him out. I would not be so dismissive. Um, I would, and I'm sure they looked into him hard. I mean, obviously they did a search warrant at his house. So, but I'd be looking at the boyfriend any boyfriends that she currently had or you know it made the confession made sense to me that when he said I would stop by the store when she was alone and talk to her that makes sense to me I could see that that's part of that confession that made sense to me the part that didn't make sense was an argument ensued she doesn't seem like she was an argumentative type person, although her aspirations were to be a lawyer. Yeah, if you look at it like that. But it seemed like she was a very kind of uh, just level-headed person, and I don't know what kind of... What would have been said to lead to an argument that he would pull out a knife and kill her? Something derogatory, sexual in nature? Maybe. But again, victimology will tell you that. What would get her to start an argument? Um, store needs to be closed and you're bothering me. 
I don't know. The thing is with that confession, if he had stopped in there and talked to her when she was alone at night on multiple times, there's got to be witnesses to that. And if none came forward, I would think maybe that it was a hoax. I just, I, I can't say whether it was or it wasn't. We've seen cruel hoaxes before in the Brian Schaefer case. We've seen it in Sherry Jo Bates's. I mean, these idiots uh, will go to great lengths just to, to be idiots. Uh, there's nothing else I can say about that. Now, another area that I would certainly look at, when that confession guy said about coming to the store and talk to her, you know who does that a lot? Security guards, mall security guards, store security guards. You know how I know that? I was never a security guard, but I worked loss prevention and I was undercover and I worked for a private investigator. This was before I became a cop. And you know what I did a lot? I talked to the clerks to pass time, so on and so forth. So I could certainly see a security guard going and talking to Tracy. Now one of the things that really bothers me in this case, and it should bother you, is if we rule out robbery, which, you know, very well could be, um, is when I was researching this case, I found one newspaper article that mentioned the security guard. And guess what his name was? Don. The same as the confession tape. Hey, I'm not saying Don is the person who did this. But he would be right up there at the number one top of my list as somebody that I would look at. I mean, come on. Security guards always go around and talk to the clerks, especially the female clerks. Uh, and for his name to be Don and the confession tape, Don. I mean, you should be able to compare the voices on that tape to Don, the security guard. But man, maybe that just lines up too perfectly. But to me, that is something that certainly has to be looked at in this case. And I would look at that right above robbery. So I would have the security guard. I would have robbery. And then I would have jealousy right underneath that. That would be the order that I'd be searching. All right. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is... They submitted evidence in 1998 and 2003 for DNA testing. Apparently that has come back nothing. And then they resubmitted in 2009 for touch DNA. So police are definitely trying. There's no doubt about that. Uh, touch DNA, I think, certainly in any close combat situation like this where stab wounds were present, more than likely the offender touched the victim and the, her clothing can be sent for touch DNA. But again, remember, uh, transfer DNA, especially working in a department store, could be certainly abundant in a case like this. So, I think that is everything that I can go over on this case. I wish I could do more, but again, to me, I would look at robbery I look at jealousy. Those are the two things um, that stand out to me, as it would probably to any investigator. I'm not saying anything that is not uh, probably common knowledge, but maybe there was something in here that investigators say, well, I didn't think about that. Maybe not. That's okay, too, as long as we get this information out and that Tracy is not forgotten. Take away everything that I said in this video. 
let's just say everything I said in this video was moronic, stupid, and made no sense. That's fine. But you know what? Tracy's name is out there. That's all that matters to me. Now, I try to make sense and use my experience in law enforcement and uh, my education in criminal profiling and criminology and all that bullshit to try to help and to deduce. And I can do that somewhat in cases like this. Uh, but if I'm wrong, that's fine. As long as Tracy's name is out there and we don't forget her. Um, one of the things that I failed to mention is that her parents went to the scene because they knew something was wrong. They thought it was just car trouble. Unfortunately, when they seen the police cars, uh, still they held out hope it was just a robbery. And then they got the unspeakable truth about what really happened. And my heart goes out to them as it does to all victims' families because they are victims too. And if this video can get out there and maybe shed a light on somebody, something to come forward, that's what we want to do, folks. That's the important thing. The most important thing. Okay? So condolences to Tracy's family, Tracy's friends, and I hope this case gets solved and it's not cold. And hopefully one day it'll be unsolved no more. So until then, man's out. Yes.